This video has been very kindly sponsored today by ExpressVPN, a virtual private network service that gives you complete protection whenever browsing public Wi-Fi in hotels, cafes, airports, and keeps all your sensitive information like credit card numbers utterly safe from any hacking attempts that may occur. Please stay tuned until before the outtakes of this video to find out more, and if you want to support the channel in an extra way, check the description and get started right now. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. <laughs> Isn't it great to go back to the past, take a look at yourself and improve everything? Well that's what I'm doing today but in Kid Icarus episode form because you see, I did a video about an obscure PS1 platformer known simply as Klonoa in around December 2012. <laughs> It's terrible and I hate it. I know I can't be too hard on myself. At that point I was still a baby in terms of how I wanted to make YouTube videos and was not the best at video quality, editing, or how well, how's the wife and kids? Or writing, but I still believe my quaint little video of an 18 year old me trying desperately hard to stand out in the sea of YouTube game reviewers does not do such a great game any justice whatsoever. The footage is bad, the lighting is bad, my curtains are just bloody disgusting, and overall it's one of those videos I made that I kind of want to completely redo, just like I did with my Crash Bandicoot trilogy videos. Well, I mean, I like to think that my video creating has improved since then. If it hasn't, then I should probably just pour boiling water on my face and give up. <laughs> but regardless, with the Klonoa video specifically, I decided that I just was not happy with it at all, leading to the inception of today's video. Here's the thing, I bloody love this game and I want to show it a good time, so welcome one and all to my Klonoa revisiting. Seriously though, what the hell is going on in this picture? What am I even doing? Why am I hunched over like that? I'm 14 in this picture, not 80. Ah, Klonoa. It's been too long. And how I've missed you. But I don't miss you as much as that point blank demo disc inside this case that went missing over a decade ago. Please come home! Daddy needs you! Do you want a needlessly complicated game title? Then look no further than Clanor Daughter Fanta. What? I mean, look at these words here. Boat, float, coat. By this logic, is his name Klonoa? I'm looking at this game again for the channel over six years later, and it might as well be called Klonoa. I still can't pronounce it. Anyway, Klonoa was released in Japan initially in extremely late 1997 for the PlayStation and was directed by one Hideo Yoshizawa, who, believe it or not, directed the first two original Ninja Gaiden games for the NES. Yeah, how you go from this to this will forever be a mystery to me. Maybe there's something Hideo isn't telling us. Original concepts for the game stemmed from the observation that Yoshizawa had during this time, where he felt that many Japanese developers and publishers weren't focusing enough on story-driven adventures to keep kids and adults more invested with the gameplay. With the PS1 being the leading console for power and ease of development at the time too, I can kind of see where he was coming from. I mean, god, the man practically invented cinematic video game cutscenes on the bloody NES. After a load of scrapped concepts, including one where the main character was this soulless, insipid tennis player, the more serious motifs were dropped, the kids became the new target demographic, and then snickle, snuffle, snap, here we are with the much more pleasant, charming, and mischievous mascot we all know today and I can't tell you how much more this pleases me over the story of this game was also changed from a serious, ancient, robotic, ruined world kind of thing to a much more imaginative and inspired plot about Klonoa needing to save his home world created by good dreams from an evil bastard called Guardius who wants to destroy everything and restart the universe with his endless supply of nightmares. Throw in a little bit of mystery involving a legendary kingdom that may or may not exist that Guardius needs to find to complete his plans, a kidnapped singer that needs to be able to sing in order to restore balance to the world, and a loving grandpa that has your back and sets you off on your quest with his wealth of knowledge, and yeah, once again, thank god we weren't left with- we boot the game up and get told that it's loading. Oh, no, sorry. It's LOADING! Lord, no. And after an utterly adorable introduction with no explanation or context given to anything, we get possibly the greatest title screen in gaming history. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. No joke. It pops up, does it? And then just stops. It's like a late night mugging. It gets straight to the point, you know? But because the jingle is so happy, it's more like a late night mugging at Disneyland. And yes, even after all this time, it still makes me want to jump up and dance. <laughs> Off we go then. This will access the memory card. Brilliant stuff. Let's get on with it then. Are you having a laugh? Oh well, gotta start again. Back to the jingle! <laughs> so now I've actually plugged in a memory card and- 
Oh, come on now! What? Why? What's wrong with you, you stupid, untrustworthy, 24-year-old plastic slab? I'm not even intentionally trying to call back to my original Klonoa video where I put the memory card in and it was full. I'm just convinced I cannot play Klonoa on PS1 without memory card issues. You know what? I'm just not going to save the game. What's my name? Who cares? Ploppy. That's my name. Ploppy the Gamer. The actual intro cutscene then begins, and I must be honest, it seems pretty ominous. <laughs> After that, though, it's just as adorable as the intro cinematic before the menu screen, except with more time dedicated to things that actually matter, and a setup on what's going on entirely with no dialogue. It does its job really well, and then- Klonoa DIES! <laughs> now I'm just joshing, it's only a dream, because in the real world, you will only ever get killed by- <laughs> Much cute. A strange object crashes into the hillside from the sky, the fantastic liberating soundtrack begins to ease into the scene to get your sense of adventure itching, you have a quick bit of back and forth with your best bud Hugh Pow, and away you go, you prat! <laughs> What a fantastic intro to the game and its atmosphere, eh? I can't wait to see what else it has in store. Oh, oh, oh. Come on now, you have to be pulling my leg. This is supposed to be my enemy. The hostiles. The things that will willingly hurt me and are complicit in endangering the lives of everyone in this universe by working for the main antagonist. Nah, I've got it wrong. It must be a friend. Come on, let's go and say hello. I'm sure he'll give me some hints and tips. Well, you can screw off, can't you? Yes, believe it or not, these bubbly little buggers are indeed enemies and they will attack you. For something that looks as sweet as that, taking damage from them feels like a betrayal more than anything else. But in order to fight back, does Klonoa punch? No. Use a gun? No. A whip? No. Jump on their heads? No. Klonoa uses his friend Hugh Pow inside a ring he's always carrying to pick up the foe and inflate them. Because of course you do that. This is Japan. Think of it like how you attack in Dig Dug, but without the mess afterwards. Now I do know this style of attack is trying to keep more with the cute aesthetic more than anything else, but honestly I can't help but just feel sorry for these guys whenever I have to do this. I cannot begin to fathom how that must feel, especially when you get them stuck under a low platform. <laughs> This here is how most of the gameplay unfolds. You run from left to right and inflate enemies to use them for extra jumps or projectiles for all manner of platforming challenge you can imagine that get progressively harder and more complicated the further into the game you get. And if I didn't know any better, the enemies really seem to enjoy the inflation. Alas, you don't only run left to right though. That would be fine, but that's not what makes this one of the best platformers on the PS1. Instead, Klonoa Door to Pantomime runs with the concept of Two point five D. Two point five D. Yeah, that. A gameplay style seen in lots of titles from the PS1 days like Tombi and Hercules that even gets used in games nowadays like Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate and Little Big Planet 3. What is it though? Well, it's not 2D and not 3D, hence the name. You get rudimentary 2D platforming and structure with left and right movement, but all taking place around sprawling 3D environments that allow you to interact and platform between them with the in and out dimensions as well as left and right. Lots of games do 2D platforming in 3D environments like Shantae Half Genie Hero for instance, but where Klonoa shines is how moving left and right is only the beginning of the game. You can not only interact with faraway objects within different depths of the environment depending on which direction you face, and throw enemies at points of interest towards or away from the screen, but there are stages like the Tree Mansion of Machinery and especially all the final stages in the Moon Kingdom that take what would usually be a standard slightly tricky Mario-esque platforming fare and transform them into large interconnected multi-dimensional miniature universes begging to be explored. All filled with tons of diversions, optional routes, hidden challenges and all sorts to not only reward your curiosity but make you a appreciate how much thought went into the intertwining of these levels. If a stage is slightly more linear than another though, it doesn't matter because even in earlier stages, you'll see places and things in the background that appear to just be decoration but then end up being a place you can actually climb up to. There'll be enemies that attack you from the background that you can either reach later or attack from the foreground. There'll still be optional side routes just a little bit smaller that you can notice from another part of the level and it makes you think, hmm, how do you get there? And therefore urge you to search around the level extra hard for a door you might have missed or a method of using an enemy that allows you to flip your way onto that particular x-axis to reach it, and my god, do you have any clue how satisfying it is when stages let you flip the x-axis around like that totally naturally by you just platforming around like you always would? Look at me! I'm Jesus! Aside from some of the most creative and inventive use of 2.5D mechanics for the PS1 days though, the way the actual platforming and enemy inflating- God, that sounds weird. 
is deepened and kept fresh throughout the entire runtime is nothing short of miraculous. Klonoa, daughter Pint of Milk, is great at introducing concepts and challenges to you based around grabbing and throwing enemies in safe locations and then lets you loose with more challenges expanding on these ideas that get more complex and life draining with every stage. You'll begin with things like grabbing enemies and throwing them into bigger enemies to get past, but soon that will evolve into freezing the bigger enemy so you can jump on them while holding another enemy in order to reach a higher platform, which will then soon evolve into jumping over a hazard to grab an enemy mid-jump, allowing you to double jump into another airborne enemy, allowing you to jump mid-air yet again to reach what you need. Mix that in with the fact that your sense of timing is often tested and that double jumping with enemies automatically throws them towards the floor, and you can then see how much more experimental things can get in the game. You'll start to find enemies only attackable by you throwing an enemy down on top of them while jumping over them. You'll find timed bomb enemies that require you placing them in different dimensions of the environment in order to briefly unlock a door. New enemies with invincibility periods, defensive maneuvers, or brand new ranged attacks, and new movements that you need to get your head around. And then you'll find moments where all of these new enemy styles start working together while over bottomless pits. And in some of my favourite parts of stages, you'll find these optional moments of you trying to rescue one of the six captured citizens hidden around the stage, which often require pinpoint precision platforming and timing to pull off without losing a life or a ton of health. This all makes the difficulty curve of the game as smooth as my earlobes because of how these great snippets of new concepts and challenges are delivered to you on top of everything else that you already know. You can even use enemies in unintended ways like saving yourself from death at the last minute if you mess up a jump, but don't rely on this since the game is smart and locks you out from certain areas that you can't fit through while holding an enemy to make sure you aren't cheating. With everything considered and the fact this is clearly for babies. I'm sure I've made Klonoa sound a bit too easy, but that's not entirely the case. I mean, the game isn't impossible, it's mostly straightforward, but it will test you, especially if you plan to go after all the trapped citizens. Not just because of the unique platforming and enemy situations themselves, but because you also have a flutter jump that you can steer mid-air for a tiny bit of distance at the cost of extremely slow speed, so relying on it can a lot of the time kill you. And even though you get a generous six hits before losing a life, invincibility frames are pathetic, giving you only brief windows of mistakes that can drain you to death if you panic and can't can't get out of those situations. Plus, you can't rely on the checkpoints to save you if you get past a particularly hard optional citizen rescue challenge, but then die later on in the stage and haven't hit a checkpoint, well, tough. You'll go back to your last checkpoint and all the collectibles you found after that point will be resetted, so you have to go through them again. For kids getting into 2.5D platformers or adults looking for a decent, engaging challenge alike, the balance is struck brilliantly, if you ask me. Wanna know what's even better than all of this, though? The only action buttons you have are jump and grab. That is it. Not only making the base game extremely easy to pick up and understand, but also streamline the more difficult sections to be as simple to execute and as satisfying as possible to overcome without you having to worry about hitting the wrong combination of multiple button commands. Throwing this in the stew pot with everything else in the game, including a practically perfect running speed, tight control responsiveness, perfect jump arc, and a great camera that tracks you perfectly and shows you everything on the screen that you need for the multi-dimensional platforming to work without screwing you over off screen, and you have a 2.5D platformer that lets you focus entirely on what is happening on the screen. Because of how well every element of the programming and level design works together and the simple control scheme, if you go wrong in Klonoa, it's 100% down to you not being able to solve the platforming puzzle and nothing else. those bits when you slide. Okay, yeah, this bit sucks. You see, once Klonoa moves for a while, he'll pick up momentum, and when you stop moving in this speed, he slides for a few feet before stopping, which is totally fine on its own. Except whenever you jump, you automatically reach top speed for Klonoa in mid-air, meaning that if you land a tricky jump and don't let go of the arrow buttons until the second after you land, Klonoa will read that as movement at top speed, and so once you let go of the arrow button after you've landed, you'll slide once you hit the floor. And this left me with a lot of close calls or outright deaths, which isn't too great. But in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't affect the game as a whole, since most of the jumps are possible with allowing you to stop mid-air if need be. Well damn it all, there's a locked door here and I need a key. I've searched the whole stage for it and it definitely is not not here. Where the hell is this key? Oh, I've got an idea. I'll just ask the security guard for the key and he'll just give me it. How are you employed? This is one of the many colourful characters you'll encounter in Klonoa, Daughter Phantom Virus, and they are practically all weird, freaky, thick, or a mixture of all the above. This guard here was bad enough for just letting me have the key to the granny of the woods he's supposed to be protecting. Seriously, it took no convincing whatsoever. I suppose he realised he couldn't hurt me with a dinner fork, so it was a wise choice. Why do they so desperately want to just let me through to get to their granny? I'm really Sorry guys, but Saki's skin isn't really my cup of tea. And those useless guards aren't the only ones to look out for. There are these two guys in the temple near the end of the game that have this brilliant exchange once you exit it. What are you waiting for? How about you guys? We're pacifists. We're wimps. Then there are these Johnnies that the game calls soldiers. Yes, soldiers. 
as in they fight in an army and have most likely seen blood. Now let me see your war face! Ah! You also get this guy from the start of the game who not only sounds very important well, to you too, but his name is also Balu... Bal... Balu? Balu the Bear! The weirdness doesn't stop there though, he also dedicated his life to sculpting a famous singer into the side of a cliff and is building a tower to reach the mythical and possibly not even real moon kingdom. And when he's called a little bit strange for doing that, this happens. <laughs> Looks like the enemies aren't the only ones that enjoy expanding. I would say this was quite a surprising moment when taking a step back, but what ruins it slightly is how Balu and Klonoa will stay like this indefinitely until you continue the dialogue box. It looks so bloody dumb, I love it. I don't know what's better though, the fact that they can stay like this forever, or that Hugh Powell couldn't give less of a crap. It's also cool how the characters themselves are indeed 2D sprites that exist within a 3D world. I've always loved that visual approach, it reeks of quirky to me. Speaking of, for the visuals as a whole, my god I love it. The game looks excellent. The graphics make me want to toilet myself. I think what makes this game stand out visually aren't only the fantastic designs of every creature you come across and the great sprite quality to give the cute factor the acceptable level of detail it deserves, but also the fact that polygonal areas work wonderfully with the sprites. Not only visually to give the game depth and life, but in a gameplay sense too. It feels like everything you see in the game was thought about for its inclusion and that helps in shaping the world that you travel through. Or at the very least, if something 3D pops into the foreground and background, it will definitely pique your curiosity to if you're able to interact with it later. And if if not, no biggie because it looks cool and fits with the multi-dimensional platforming theme anyway. They also went out of their way to have the stages actually engage with Klonoa himself. This isn't Mario with random unrelated turtles and mushrooms just walking back and forth for no reason. Enemies behave on their own accord around you. They run away, they get curious or suspicious of you when they're far away. It feels like you're kind of intruding on these creatures' homes, which even though it makes me feel a little bit bad, is a nice touch. Unrelated, when I was a kid playing this game for the first time, I was convinced that these weren't Klonoa's ears and they were actually abnormally giant hands, meaning that every time he ran around I thought he looked like this. What I thought he was doing when he flutter jumped though, your guess is as good as mine. And when talking about glitches, I honestly found the entire thing to be totally glitch free, except from these gears and belts that push you around in this stage. Aren't they supposed to be moving? And there's also one part of the entire game where it's possible to do this. Yes, for some reason, Klonoa has a total fit whenever going down this particular rock, and it never happens again in the game. For the rest though, even though the game is mostly cute from start to end, when it needs to get more threatening, it does, which in turn makes those more trippy moments feel even more disturbing when comparing them to the rest of the game. Just like, for example, with the main bad guy of the game, Guardius, and how intimidatingly he's introduced. What was that? Somebody! Check out how out of place this guy is with the rest of the game. He does not belong here full stop. And his dissonant aggressive music theme mixed in with one of the most daunting voices in gaming that's so terrifying that even PT copied it. <laughs> makes Guardius a threat from appearance alone, not only with the other powers he's capable of. And one of those powers he has is knocking out little girls and hiding them inside his coat. Oh god. Somebody call the FBI. The funny thing is though, after all that happens, the game has absolutely no problem backhanding you in the face and 180s you right over to the cutest character in the game. <laughs> I mean, for the love of God, come on. If you don't fall in love with this thing, you have no soul. I've also just realized how strange Klonoa's screen-facing idol animation is. Why is he so bloody miserable? What's this guy's problem? Klonoa hates fun. And don't you dare jump while he's looking at the screen because that just outright offends him. I suppose though that in the correct context, this goes from a moping idol animation to an epic ultra badass victory pose. <laughs> Speaking of badass, I gotta say, another terrific thing about Klonoa, door to pants on Miffy, are the boss battles. They always test how you use your grabbing and throwing in totally different ways to make each boss feel completely unique, and they have some of the most creative attacks in the game, making use of the 2.5D mechanics splendidly. Not to mention, have you heard this music? After which, to calm you down after all the intensity, the game throws this gorgeous little lullaby at you while fireworks go off to close off a chapter to your adventure.
This, I would argue, is the main reason to go for all the hidden citizens in the stages, not only for some of the best challenges and utterly nuts unlockable final stage, but after beating that stage perfectly, you get access to a music menu for this incredible soundtrack. I know nowadays you can just look it up online, like with many of these unlockables from early PS1 gaming days, but at the time this was a cool reward along with the hidden bonus stage. Holy shit, help me! Bullet Bill is packing heat! In the final moments of the game though, after you've helped out all the hierarchy of Phantom Isle and closed yourself into Guardius for the final attack, it's here where Klonoa has the cutest scene in the whole game where your grandpa gets bombed. What the hell is wrong with you, Klonoa? After spending the entire game jiggling car keys in my face, you're then gonna make me sit here and watch my innocent, caring grandfather die in our arms while he gasps and mutters his final words? It's horrible, and it's not what you're expecting at all, making it even more awful. This revelation is then followed up by Hugh Pow, this cute little bugger squeaking and chirping to you throughout the whole game, morphing into his true form since he turns out to be the prince of the legendary Moon Kingdom. And he doesn't only look like a total knob, but also doesn't change his voice. <laughs> I don't know guys, I can't take this too seriously and after what just happened, I don't know how I should feel about any of it. Oh lord, watch out, he's coming for ya! We then finally meet with Guardius, who is still as creepy and disturbing as he was earlier, now he's been caught grating his carrot. Seriously, what is going on under that cloak? I think we just need to go ahead and destroy him before he can do anything more sickening. Oh god, no, Guardius, what are you doing? Shut your eyes, kid! And then we beat him in a pretty epic final boss and everything is safe and sound. But joke's on you, he isn't really dead and he's starting the beginning of the <laughs> perfect nightmare. Now, you know that tired old trope that bad stories use to get the main characters out of difficult situations by having them wake up and realize it was all just a bad dream? Well, in Klonoa, you are the dream. That's a new one. Yeah, after you beat the final, final boss, if you're Dying grandpappy wasn't enough, you discover that Klonoa himself is actually not supposed to be here. He's a powerful dreamwalker and was summoned by Hu Pao to save Phantom Isle, and Hu Pao also implanted fake memories inside Klonoa to make him trust him to save the world together with him as his fake best friend. And in the biggest gut punch of an ending for a kid's game, a melancholy song is being la 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 in your face while our main characters cry their eyes out and get separated. Hey everyone, you see these two here? Yeah, these two from this lovely little game that I'm playing about two Two little critters going on a lovely adventure. Well, I hope you're not a fan of it because it's evil and I'm going to cleanse it. I hope you enjoy hell. Even better, after this, the game just stops. The end. How cruel. This was a three plus for God's sake. Yeah, for toddlers upwards. Imagine that. Hey kids, here's a happy flappy game about a kitty weenie with Pac-Man on his head. But your best friend isn't real and your granddad's dead. The implications of this ending are way too heavy as well. I mean, Klonoa truly believes that Phantom Isle is his home. Look at how distraught he is when he's told the truth. He doesn't believe it. He'd rather be in this fake reality with artificially implanted memories than with his real friends and family he likely doesn't even remember. By the end of the game, Hu Pao and Klonoa may have been through a lot and became true friends deep down, and at the end of the day, if Klonoa wasn't 100% complacent with the idea of saving the day, then the entire universe of good dreams would have ended, meaning nobody would be here in this universe, so that's better than nothing, but I really don't think Hu Pao had to go that extra step to ensure Klonoa's loyalty to him, only to then rip it away from him once the deed was done. Yeah, he's upset about it, but he knew it was coming. Even better, while I spent the entire credit sequence pondering all of this in my head, it finally ended and closed off this depressing little tale with the front cover of Klonoa the Book, written by the treasured and respected author Ploppy! Well, to be more serious for a second, yeah, even though that ending does appear out of absolutely nowhere with the only hints of it coming up in the game being that the names of the stages are called Visions, I honestly think that endings like that make you look back at the more memorable story moments in a completely fresh perspective. And yeah, it's depressing as hell, but that doesn't make it bad. It's thought-provoking to say the least, and it's a pretty decent twist for a platforming game for children. And what a great game it is overall. Klonoa may have had positive to mixed reception at its release, but I've got to say, I don't understand the mixed reception at all. This is one of the best platformers on the planet PlayStation as far as I'm concerned, with a lot of challenge to offer along with original concepts and art direction. The difficulty curve is great, the bosses are great, the optional stuff is top notch and well worth going after, the visuals pristine, and the only thing holding it back as a video game for me is the length of it. It took me around 4 hours to finish the story and maybe another 30 minutes for hidden content. It's a bit of a short ride, but that doesn't matter too much when the ride is this much damn fun and memorable. In the end though, it just makes me wonder why we were able to get Namco developed and published games on the PS Classic like Ridge Racer Type 4, Tekken 3 and Mr. Driller. But there's no love for Klonoa anywhere. It may not be associated with PlayStation platformer mascot stardom like Crash and Spyro were, but this game stands out against them tenfold. Hell, I mean, even the guy I was talking about earlier in this video, the director of this game, he produced Mr. Driller and supervised Ridge Racer Type 4. So, I mean, why wasn't this included on the PS Classic?
And why was it remade on the Wii? Hey everybody and thank you so much for watching today's video right until the very end. Outtakes will be on in just a second so please stay tuned for that but first I'd love to give another thanks to the sponsors for this video today who have supported this channel in an amazing way ExpressVPN. As I said earlier ExpressVPN is an extremely useful service that I have used myself many a time in order to encrypt my data whenever using public Wi-Fi and keep all my vital payment information totally secure and since I go to many a hotel with my job this is a crucial bit of kit for me. Once you sign up all you need is the app for your PC, Mac, iPhone, Android, Linux, there's so many choices to go through and then all you do is sign in, open up the app, press the little button there, um, once you've picked your server location at the bottom as well and then you get connected. There we go, we're connected. And since it has the fastest speeds of other VPN providers, you won't think twice about hitting that button whenever you start browsing. At less than $7 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee, you can't really go wrong. And by going into the description below to the link expressvpn.com forward slash caddy, you can get yourself a three month free trial of it. Yeah, free. So go and check it out right now to help support the channel and also Thank you to all the people on screen right now from my Patreon page who have also supported the channel in an amazing way. Thank you so much, every single one of these people, and special, special thanks to the top tier Patreon supporters for this month. Basil, I have a portal gun, Exopaz, Matthew Hubble, Mills Kahai, Brandon Brandon, Kirsten B, Cyberpunk Symphony, Nicole Ganara, Dave Marshall, Nathan Young, The Game Shed, Daniel Leon, Mitchell Reed, Gamer Mohammed 2017, and AD Thornton Smith. Thank you so much, every single one of you amazing people. Cat Icarus episode form, because you see. A couple of... A couple of... I'm not even intentionally trying to call back to my original Klonoa video when I put the game in and I forgot the words of the script, like I always do. <laughs> <laughs> no! Did you enjoy that? I hurt my nose! Sorry! <laughs> I'm so sorry. Were you having too much fun? <laughs> oh. oh my god. Oh! <laughs> I'm awake now. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> we locked him outside for filming and he still finds a way to interrupt it. <laughs> By the way, see those cards up there? Yeah, it's Phoebe's birthday today. Well, She's not a boy, so ignore that one. And Pepper has been given a Serge Tankian beard and Pepper's asking George to make sure that George didn't poo himself, but there's poo in the corner of the card, so it didn't really work out, did it? We just got our filming walking around our housing estate with hammers and nails, <laughs> looking quite dodgy. And we come home with to this thing here. I go get you! Well I don't mind. He's poop! He's going poop! But what's he doing? Who said you need toys to play with a dog? 